Give everybody a minute to join. Did I tell you I met a new cousin today? No. She messaged me. She found me on Ancestry.com last night. She did her DNA thing back in December, and we were talking for a long time today, sending pictures back and forth. Hmm. She's What's a Mitchell. Mitchell, okay. A cousin you didn't know you had. Yep. I was pretty excited. That's good. We got brothers and sisters we didn't know we had all over. That's true. All right. We'll let everybody get in here another minute. We'll open in prayer. We're in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 4. Hey, Roberta, how are you? Hey, Roberta. Good to see you. <clears throat> I was talking to Erin today, and she was telling me that she joined Tuesday Bible study, which she never gets to do, but she was able to join, and she couldn't get any volume. She couldn't get any sound, and she had... She clicked over on other things and had sound, but just on my Bible study, she couldn't. But you had sound on the... Oh, yeah, because mm. we had, you know, mm. a lot of sound, lots of commenting. Hey, Cheryl and Robert. Hey, it's Bob. Cheryl and Bob. Cheryl and Bob. All right. Love y'all. We are still here, surprisingly, <clears throat> because we have been rained on for so long. We we might start floating away soon. <clears throat> All right, we're going to open in prayer. Maybe some more folks will come in here in a minute, and we'll try to get started on time. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for bringing us together once again. We thank you for your blessed word, and we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide us in our study tonight, help us to grow in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> we have about four studies going on right now every week for our family. A lot of different directions. Yes. Children's studies, Sunday morning, this one, and then uh, Angie and the girls and myself do a sort of an adult study and... It's uh, on the history of the church. History of the church. So um, Very, very interesting. Lots of different ways to study the Word of God and study about your faith. When um, the girls were younger and um, they, were in homes they were homeschooled, Angie made sure to go through all the major religions of the world and let them study and to find out why we believe what we believe. And uh, <clears throat> that's, you know, if you don't know what you believe or know what other people believe, you may not understand why you believe what you believe. And somebody might be able to come and challenge you. And if you're weak in faith, miss, you know, lead you away or whatever. So you need to, need to know why you believe what you believe. <clears throat> we are in Exodus 4, chapter 1. I noticed that we're getting a viewer number that goes up and goes off and goes up and goes off, which is not quite normal. So I hope the broadcast is doing okay. Yeah, let us know if there's problems hearing us. Yes. Let me turn this up down here and see if I hear myself. Okay. Yeah, let us know if there's problems hearing us. Sounds fine. All right, you go. So um, if you have problems with the broadcast, it's a rainy, been a rainy week here, and sometimes rain yes. gets in the telephone cables. Um, like when I used to do deal with circuits, that was a problem on older cables. Water would get in them, and uh, 
Roberta said it sounds good. All right. <clears throat> in Exodus 4, we are in the same story we left off with where Moses has gone to the burning bush and God has approached him in uh, calling him to Egypt, calling him to be the deliverer for the people of God. And so it sort of starts off funny in verse 1. Uh, but if you read Exodus 4, 1 for us. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. So immediately after God tells him that he's going to send him, Moses begins to doubt. And look back in verse 18 of the previous chapter, uh, Exodus 3:18. Uh, and that, and this is God speaking. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come thou and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. God just told him that they will listen to you. Now, I don't want to condemn Moses too much because he was a great man of faith. I just want to think about my own life when God has directly spoken something to me, and I doubted him. This right here shows us that even great men and women of God can have doubts, right? Right. We have to be very careful <coughs> doubting God when he has laid, us, laid out the proof for us, right. information for us. Remember who this man is. He's a 40-year shepherd, someone who has lost his um falling off, falling off his pedestal so to speak he is not where he started off with that was 40 years ago he has been humbled he's in a servant position not only that but he's just he's a servant and leading sheep around in the desert so he is his life is quite different and moses says they will not believe me um verse two through five and the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. I, I laugh when I read this about Moses running from the serpent because it's such a, I want to say a holy moment. God is speaking to his servant and he says, throw the staff down and he does and Moses runs. That is, that is such a um, comical thing to me, but it was not, it was, it was supposed to be him trusting God and of being obedient. But then he was obedient because he told him to catch it by the tail, right? Right. That takes a lot of faith, a lot of courage to to do that. So it makes me wonder though, it <clears throat> it's our reaction at the moment. It's not our because when he comes to himself and he thinks about what's happening, you know, we we are moved by the moment. Instead of just walking in control of ourselves, yeah. we do things foolishly on the spur of the moment. Yeah. We all do. We do. We all do. Um, so we got through five. Um, the rod was something he carried around for the sheep. Uh, protection of the sheep and also direction of the sheep. So uh, when David said, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, David was talking about a shepherd's crook, right. a shepherd's staff. And here Moses has got the same shepherd's crook, shepherd's staff. Mm -hmm. um, we have one that we use when we're dealing with animals, smaller livestock. Uh, it would seem that that smaller livestock couldn't hurt you, but they're just about knee high with their heads. And we have both had our knees hurt from things butting us 
sideways on their legs, right? Mm -hmm. um, Moses had this. He, it was a it was a well worn staff, probably. It was something he cut. He found himself a sapling or something, and he cut it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got several that we made, and then we also got one that we bought that has the crook at the top. So this was a familiar object to him, and it was something that he never knew would be what he would lead Israel out with. Right. It was a shepherd's staff. It was almost humiliating to have um, the tool of a humble shepherd to go before um, Pharaoh. And remember back when we studied Genesis that Joseph told the people not to tell them that they, they were shepherds because sheep were an abomination to right. the Egyptians. That's right. <laughs> so here he's going to come in with this, I'm going to call it a shepherd's staff, a crook, because mm -hmm. that's the image I get. And so he's going to come before Pharaoh with this, something that he abhors. Yes. And uh, read on uh, six through nine, if you would. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Okay. <clears throat> so we've got some symbolism here, along with what God gave Moses for them to for them to believe. Now he's talking about um, he knows God knows that Pharaoh's not going to listen, but these are for the people of Israel to listen to Moses. Mm -hmm. These are the signs that God is giving him. They were very specific signs. They weren't God didn't say go perform a miracle. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what the miracle is when you get there. He gave him very specific things to do. So I began to study this and look it up, see what these three symbols were. There was a serpent, his hand was leprous, and then the water becomes blood. So let's think tank here. What um, what do you think the the serpent could represent? The devil. Right. Could it represent oh. evil. Oh, I see. Oh. <laughs> oh. I saw a light going right. Above, there's a light right above. Right me. above me. Yeah. Yeah, the serpent can represent Satan, but it also was the emblem of Egypt. Egypt had the cobra, right? Yes. <clears throat> um, the asp. The asp, yeah. Yeah. So that was the first sign in uh, leprosy. And and what do we do with the devil? He scares us. We fear him. We run. But then when we think about what God said. We stop, and we take him by the tail, yeah. and he becomes something that we can use to guide us, right. not Satan, but the action uh, yeah, the fate of taking the control. Fate. That's Oh, that's good, yeah. Paul. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then the leprosy, um, it would be one thing to have a serpent there, but when your own hand becomes leprous instantly, I think that there would be a change in the way it felt yes i agree leprosy deadens it might be he lost the feeling in his hand when he put it inside his cloak and he brought it out so the leprosy uh on his hand um can re can represent sin can represent um the fall of man obviously um death death and then the healing of it Yes. That God is powerful over the flesh, right? Right. That, that's the symbolism is God has got control of this. I love that. So when we think about it, though, that's the first two, and then the third is very obvious: water becomes blood, mm -hmm. the blood of Jesus, mm -hmm. and the water. Um, he, that was his first miracle, turning water into wine. Right. right? 
Right. And so the water and the blood is the the um, blood of Jesus that we're looking at in the covenant. So when you when you look at this, you've got uh, the serpent and leprosy, and water becomes blood, and um, the blood of the covenant um, that Abraham had, but it also future tense the blood of Jesus that we see it in. They didn't have the perspective of the Messiah that we understand. So um, we're born of water, and then we're born uh, of what blood. What you say? You got you got it down here. I can't read it from there. Yeah, it's not showing. Hang on. Well, hang on. We're gonna read your comment. No blood circulating. No saving blood. Ah, that's good. Very good. That's good. Very good. I was thinking of the two births. You're born of water. Yes. And you're born of blood. Yes. The blood of Jesus Christ. Well, the water is the washing of water by the word. The water is also symbolic of the Holy Spirit cleansing us. So the so the symbolism there is very deep in that. I have never, ever, ever, ever looked at it that way. I never even thought about it. I've had to look it up this afternoon to think about what the symbols could be. Because, you know, we miss so much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it drives me crazy well, how much we miss. Everything. There's a reason for everything. So, wow. So here the um, he told him to put the staff out. It turned to a serpent. He brought it by the tail back out. And um, and actually, if you look at those three, I see another thing from our perspective, knowing about the fall of man and sin and then salvation is Satan was there, the, the snake. Um, so called sin, mm -hmm. and then the blood of Jesus fixed it. Right, right, right. So they all three took place. Wow. And uh, verse eight, he says, "If thou, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, then they'll believe the second sign." So the first sign was the enemy. So even in the Garden of Eden, there was a sign there. That God said, "You can eat of any tree except for that one." Yeah. Right? Right. There is something bad here. There's there is a choice to make. This is not a no choice life that you live. You have to make choices. Right. So God said that the first sign is the the serpent. <laughs> if they won't believe the serpent, they'll believe the second one. Well the second one was you didn't listen to me, you fell into sin. Right. See? Right. I mean you got you think you can do anything you want to, and then sin comes around and bites you, right? Right. And so you fall into sin, and it shall come to pass if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it on the dry land, and the water become blood. So the first two things, Israel didn't believe, right? They Adam fell in sin. Right. Sin came into Israel again and again and again, mm -hmm. and the water had to turn to blood. Right. They didn't believe that. This is I'm looking at stretched out over the history of Israel, not just this one instance. So yeah. there's deep symbolism here that God was was really painting prophetically. <clears throat> uh, Ten through thirteen, please. And Moses said unto the Lord. O oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O oh, my Lord, Send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Okay. So this this speculation of this passage to many people has been that Moses stuttered. Hmm. A lot of people have said that. Uh, let's look at the, the wording and see if we can get that out of there because that's, that could be one possibility. Moses says he's slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So when I looked up those words in Hebrew, uh, the word slow, used in both those passages, slow of speech and slow tongue, mm -hmm. means heavy. Mm. Or it can also mean slow, like like cumbersome, bogged down. 
And then speech and tongue, uh, your speech is your speech, but your tongue is your language. So it could it could mean had had trouble thinking fast, thinking. You know, you just think about all these things. We don't understand that, but we're going to see it as we get down a, a little bit further that it's probably not um, a stuttering because um, verse 12, God said, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. So if he teaches him, that does not sound like stuttering to me. Right. You see what I mean? So I don't believe it was stuttering. If it's slow of tongue, it could literally mean that he has been out of um, the court of Egypt so long, for 40 years, he's forgotten the language. Oh, that's interesting. Right? So he is, he could have been, I'm afraid to go back there and talk to this man that I don't even speak Egyptian anymore. He was raised in it, but when you go 40 years in another place, I, I find that I have trouble remembering people that I went to high school with. Right. If I hear a name like that sounds familiar and I have to go get my high school yearbook and see what he looked like in high school. Right. So <clears throat> in 40 years, Moses could have easily forgotten the language. And then that would that would explain why God said, I will teach thee what thou shalt say. Interesting. And another thing will come up in a minute with Aaron that kind of backs that up. Um, so he he is really reluctant to step in. And I find that fairly interesting because Moses was so sure 40 years ago that he was the deliverer. He was so sure that he killed a man. He was so sure that he went down and we read in Acts, um, I think it's chapter seven, where it said that he was sure he was the deliverer, but that the, that the uh, Israelites didn't believe him. Right. And so Moses is um Hey Mike. Moses is um reluctant and he's using excuses to get out of this. And then the final thing that he says here in thirteen, I pray thee by sin by pray thee by the hand of whom thou wilt sin. So sin in strength is what that means in um, Hebrew, sin, sin by thy hand of him, him whom thou wilt sin, it means sin and strength or sin someone worthy. Mm. So he's, he's declaring himself unworthy. I, I'm not qualified to do this. You need to go find somebody. That need, it needs to be done. It's a job that needs to be done. Find somebody to do it, please, Lord. He just told Moses, you are the one I'm calling and we can look on the outside of this this uh, scene and be very judgmental on him. But think about our own lives and how many times we back down from something that God, God says, I want you to go over there and speak to that woman. I want you to go speak to that man. I want you to, the co-worker, look at him. He, want, he needs, you know, mm -hmm. he wants us to minister to someone mm -hmm. and we're very reluctant to do yeah. it. We we don't. Uh, I want you to stand up and give give praise this morning. It's amazing how people in churches will not stand up among people that of all the people in the world. These people around you understand being lost, and they understand being found. They understand sin, and they understand forgiveness. And yet the devil will will uh, hound that person and say, "Oh, you don't want to embarrass yourself and." Get up and tell people that you needed God, right? Right. But these are the people that will accept you, right? And we get. Uh, I'd be embarrassed if I had to say that. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. All right. Um, so, so Moses tells God, "You just need to send somebody qualified." In verse fourteen, if you'd read fourteen through seventeen. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. 
and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth and i will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people and he shall be even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth and thou shalt be to him instead of god and thou shalt take this rod in thine hand and wherewith thou shalt do signs so this is another section that to me sounds like he's he thinks he's going to have trouble with the language of Egypt because he says Mo, he says Aaron your brother's coming now Aaron was from Egypt right well he was a Hebrew well he was Hebrew Egypt, but he, yeah. he he still lived in Egypt yeah and he says uh, thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. So even here, it looks to me like he he's using Aaron as an interpreter, mm. not as someone because right. Moses stutters. So right. I think we can look at this and and say that Moses maybe thought he would have trouble speaking to someone now we we don't have a um well we do some areas we have a a place where people want to understand our speech but we think we need an interpreter you know if you know we, we've made fun about people who can't understand things that we say in the south and right so uh but but here god is telling moses i will send your brother aaron as as someone you tell him and he would tell it to them right right if stuttering doesn't make sense to put to put in there does it mm -mm. no so so we we'll look at this as if he's using aaron as an interpreter um well guess what the holy spirit is our interpreter yes right? that's good he's our interpreter most and aaron was a levite which was the tribe of the priests <clears throat> and then 17 and thou shalt take this rod in thine hand wherewith thou shalt do signs so the rod the staff that he carried for the sheep all these years is going to be his scepter and i brainstormed with angie and the girls before the study and i said who who carries a staff or a scepter or something to show authority and so we came up with a band director or, or an orchestra leader with this. Yeah. And then we came up with a king with a scepter. Yes. Because like in Esther, he raises the royal scepter to her, right? Right. Um, Shepherd. Shepherds do. So the symbolism is the le of leadership. Um, I almost see Pharaoh as having something like that too. His mm -hmm. was probably gold, probably shaped like one of the gods that they they worship <laughs> what read my comment we need aaron to interpret biden yes <laughs> indeedy we do we do oh okay um and 18 through 20 and moses went and returned to jethro his father-in-law and said unto him let me go i pray thee and return unto my brethren which are in egypt and see whether they be yet alive and jethro said to moses go in peace and the lord said unto moses in midian go return unto egypt for all the men are dead which sought thy life and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return wait, into... Wait, 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 too far. Oh, sorry. Verse 20. Okay, so he tells him um, to go. He goes to his father-in-law Jethro, and Jethro gives him immediate far as we know immediate release this is a lot different than um jacob and laban right yes. laban and wanting to leave yes work some more years and yes then he sneaked off in the middle of the night 
Laban caught up with him. We just studied that some weeks back. Yes. And um, so this is a very quick release. And, and you think about it, God always has everything lined up when mm -hmm. we are doing things in his will. If, if you think you need to change jobs and you say, God, if it's your will, I, you, you fleece God and say, if it's your will, this has got to work out. I need to be able to sell the house. I need to, mm. you know, all the, all the signs. If you do that, you better be careful if you're asking for signs. Absolutely. Look what happened this few verses back when he told, told God that he doubted and God, he was basically asking for signs or asking God to really prove it to him. And you be careful when you ask God for signs, because look what he had to do. He had to grab a snake by the tail. He got the leprosy on his, on his hand, right? So the things that, that you may ask for a sign in, mm -hmm. uh, you be, be cautious about that and, and just try to trust in God because here Moses did that. He went home. He, we have no uh, sign that his wife did not want to go with him or that she said no. We don't really read about her past this or see her in the image of our mind's eye that he is that she is with him in Egypt. We don't see that. We don't see her with him crossing the Red Sea. You know what I see? Right, that's true. But here we find out that she went back with him uh, and his sons. Verse twenty. He has more than one son. I think another passage that might be First Chronicles where it talks about Moses' sons, and I think it lists two of them. Um. And he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God, rod of God in his hand. Notice how it becomes the rod of God all of a sudden. The rod of God. The rod of God. It it is what he had always used, but God turned it around for a different purpose. Yes. Right. Yeah. Paul had been raised as a Pharisee, and the scriptures that he had been uh, educated in all those passages suddenly were used for a different purpose. Right. When when we become called, we got get called by God to do something, the training that we've had in the past does not become null and void, but God turns and uses it Amen. for a purpose. Amen. Moses was trained in living in the wilderness, finding water in the wilderness, leading a bunch of dumb sheep, which is what the people of Israel were at this time. They were dumb sheep that complained and made a lot of noise. Mm. He, he became the perfect leader for them. Um, he was trained perfectly, and now God uses all this training for his purpose. So when God, when you, you have a life that you don't, don't think has anything to do with ministry or anything to do with witnessing or anything to do with anything of God and then all of a sudden God turns that <laughs> around we've we've seen people that um, let's say they um, were welders and think well I'm just a welder that doesn't mean anything by God but then you get this opportunity to minister to someone because of your welding uh, and you reach out to them and they connect with you because of that and I guess that's my point is God uses anything even a stick for his glory Amen. Amen. <clears throat> 21 through 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, and he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. But, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Okay. This is a, this is a, a hard concept for a lot of people, or it is a scripture of contention where people want to cut down God and the way he operates. When God says, I'm going to harden his heart, People say, or they think, why would God harden his heart and basically cause him to sin and then um, turn around and punish him for it? 
right? Theological mm -hmm. question. Why would yeah. God harden someone's heart? And I got to thinking about that. All God's got to do to harden someone's heart is back away. Oh, that's good. Right? Right. They're already hard in their heart. Yeah. He he brings in grace and mercy into someone's life and softens that person by his presence and his love and his mercy and grace. It it softens a person's life. But we are without hope when he backs away. If he like in um Romans chapter one, if you want to study Romans chapter one, where people are turned over to a reprobate mind, it says God turned them over to a reprobate mind. When people were that way, he just backed away. When someone says, I'm going to do this my way, get out of the way. If your hand is in their life, you will be blamed for it. If you back away, they can fall on their own face and they won't have anybody to blame. Right. Right. So Absolutely. God, all he had to do to, to harden Pharaoh's heart was to back away because any kind of compassion that Pharaoh would have had would have been from God. Amen. That's a good point. So when it says God hardened his heart, uh, don't think about that he went in there and he did something evil. Yeah. But God just backed away. And when God backs away, the devil just came in. Nature abhors a vacuum. <laughs> Yes, it does. Nature abhors a vacuum. Oh, so that this is this is easy to understand. That and we look at we know the whole story and we know that it was for his miracles to be seen in in uh, Egypt for the Egyptian people, but we also know it was for the Hebrew people. Yes, the Hebrew people lived through those ten plagues even though they weren't touched like the Egyptian people. And we needed to see those 10 plagues. And we needed to see them. And when we go through Passover, we quote those things, right? And you know, the truth of it is, if we can honestly, at some point of our life and our walk with the Lord, recognize that the suffering we go through is to make us more like Christ. It's, it's for our good. Yes. Instead of getting so upset and blaming God and acting mad and acting betrayed and all this stuff, it has taken me years to figure that out. But I know that. I know it in the depth of my soul that I need to be grateful for everything that comes seemingly against me as a plague, right. so to speak. All things work together all for good. All things do. All things work together for good. Yes, those that are called according to his purpose. Yes. Okay. We need to accept it and move forward. So God hardened his, said he was going to harden his heart. Mm -hmm. Now we, we come to a very interesting passage that I've actually gotten emails about. Mike's got a comment there. Okay. I don't know why this is not shifting to my live chat. Mike said the people had to see that God indeed was the one that delivered them and not Moses. Boom. Amen. That's a boom point. That, that is a good point, Mike. Yes. Because if, if Moses had come in there and and talked Pharaoh out of this, then Moses would have been the leader. And that's where we have so much problem today as we look at men and women in political office or wherever in leadership and we say they are our leaders and then they fail us pastors uh, that fall from grace and they fall into sin and we we walk away from the church you know i'm never going to church again that man embezzles a hundred thousand dollars from the church and we look at all that and we're looking to men if we do that we need to look to god that's right good point very good thank you for sharing that mike um 24 through 26 is a very interesting passage and it came to pass by the way, in the end, that the Lord <laughs> met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go when she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. I've, I've had... 
people write me about this, yeah. this passage. This was a troublesome, bothering passage for people. We don't know a lot of the details about this, how she knew. We don't know uh, the mystery of the Lord met him and sought to kill him. This, I'm assuming, is like the angel of death. This is um, something that Zipporah understood that Moses had let go. And we need to see the lesson in this or the the, the uh, story that God's trying to show us out of this that Moses jumped up and was running to his new ministry, his new calling. He was convinced that he was supposed to go deliver. He jumped up, he packed his things and got his family and they took off and it came to pass by the way in the end, so they were en route to, maybe they were outside some lodging or something, that the Lord met him. Now, Zipporah somehow knew this. She knew what was going on. She was the one that saw the angel, the one that perceived. Is it possible that this son was not the eldest son and maybe they had circumcised the eldest son and he had forgotten? We don't know. We don't know which son or both sons. I'm just saying that could be how she knew that he had not taken care of what he True. should have. He could have done the first one and not the second one. Got so involved with the situation. We have got those fruit fly little gnat things in our house and I can't get rid of them. So we're not nuts batting things around. <laughs> Oh, you know. So, so she did it herself. Like Angie said, somehow she knew. Maybe it was one of the sons and not the other. Somehow she understood that Moses had not done this, and this was a. She was not Hebrew. Nope. She was Midianite, <clears throat> so she knew this was what you're supposed to do. So I, I thought about this. And I thought about how many times that I have failed as, my, as a man of God and also had seen other men fail that jump into ministry and forget their family. They jump in to do their call. I'll do my other quote in here. My call. <laughs> they they do, are going for the call. And they they basically ignore. Neglect. They they. Neglect their family. Mm -hmm. um, men of God, this is what we're looking at. That's right. right. Um, Angie and I know a missionary who his family is falling apart. He, he's usually in some other country. His family is not taken care of. Back home, he goes and basically... Um, I don't want I don't want to say too many things because I probably would be judging things I might not know about, but the man does not take care of his family and it's very clear. And it's it's literally caused his family to fall apart. Uh he ended up having an affair. I can say that because nobody knows who I'm talking about. Had an affair with a woman in another country, a whole soap opera kind of thing. This man is not taking care of his wife. I've seen other People that basically told their wives and their children that I'm doing this, whether you're with me or not, and split the family split up. Mm -hmm. God does not do things. God does not call people to things that will split your family up. That's fact. That's fact. That's against his word. He does not call people to do things that destroy your family. Moses had neglected his family, and his wife stepped in, and... She said, a bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. So she did the thing that he, as the priest of his home, was supposed to do. And um, I think that's that's a everyday lesson for us. We need to make sure we take care of our family first. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 27 through 31. Let's finish this out. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. 
And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their infliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Mm -hmm. So Aaron was called by God and said, go into the wilderness and meet him. He met him in the mountain of God. So he met him in Sinai. He met him in the mountain of God there. And we we read this, and it's a few verses apart, but there's a lot of traveling to do here. So understand this. Just because you read that Aaron met him, verse 28, Moses told him all the things that happened. Verse 29, Moses and Aaron went and gathered all the elders. That was back in Egypt. So we just need to understand the travel time and could be days or weeks, months even. I don't know. There could have been a, mm -hmm. a, a block, block of time here we're not seeing in these segments of Scripture. So an, another thing that that I think backs up my theory on that Moses was using as an interpreter is that Moses and Aaron went... Uh, Moses told Aaron all the words and the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. So he gave it to him. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say he interpreted. He passed it along even mm -hmm. to the Israelites. Yes. The people believed. I can see God now shaking his head saying, I told you they would. You know, I told you so. I told you they would. They believed. Um. And when they, they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. Amen. When you know that God has heard you, worship. Yes. Right? Yes. When you know God's heard you. Mm -hmm. The deliverance hadn't come yet, but just the fact that you know that God has heard you is a reason to worship. Right? Yes. Deliverance will come. That's right. Worship. worship. Worship first. Worship first. They bowed their heads and thank God for what was about to happen. When we know that we need a miracle before the miracle gets there, when we know that we've prayed through and God's heard us and we know we believe that this is in the will of God and we <laughs> excuse me, worship. Amen. Amen. Worship. Um, I love that. I love it. I love it. That's a good chapter. That's a power-packed chapter. It is. It's very rich. It's it rich is a chapter. rich one. Okay. No, it's fair. Next week, Lord willing, Exodus chapter 5 will continue on. Um, what did Mike say in that last comment? That's the one I already read. That God indeed delivered oh, them and not Moses. Got you. Okay. Didn't want to miss anything? I know Kathy has something going on, and Lori and Mike have something going on today. Yeah. So We've been getting messages popped up during this Bible study of people that could, couldn't be here. And they, they, we've seen I the appreciate messages. that. That's yeah. very sweet of them. And we, we miss you. Hopefully you'll be listening on the recorded version. Yes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, um, contact us. We'd just love to hear from you. I, I told Angie today, I noticed there's about 15 or 20 people that regularly listen uh, because we get that many views right up front when it gets posted. And then through time, depending on the content, or I don't know what it, what it depends on, it may get a lot of, of views. Uh, maybe it's a certain chapter that we look at or a certain topic. Yeah. But um, We'd love to hear from you, and um, hopefully that, that we're going to all grow in this. Just, Amen. Just like I, I said earlier, the three things, the serpent, the leprosy, and the water becoming blood, those were I love that. Symbolic. I'm going to have to really study that out that's some more. That's worth studying further. Yeah, that's right? really good. So um, keep us in prayer. We Like I said, we've got a lot going on, and... Um, it's been raining. We need to get out in our garden and start doing a little bit of planting, but we can't even get out there because we are so sopping wet. 
You sink down to your calf muscles when you get out there. Yeah, our driveway is bad, bad shape. Everybody's is, really. I mean, we've had so much rain. Yep. And I, we thought it was going to be nice today, and it has rained nonstop all day. But thank the Lord we don't have ice. I know there are some parts of the country that are under ice right. and snow. So we rejoice in that. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye.